Grace and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Jacksonville First United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're joining us online this morning as we continue to practice social distancing. Uh, what a joy, though, it is that we can still gather together in the spirit of Jesus Christ and worship uh, Jesus together. Uh, so welcome this morning. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, we're glad that you're here with us as we join together in worship this morning. Our... Uh, if you're a guest with us today, we're glad that you're here too as well. And if you'd like to know more about the church, I invite you to go online to our website, jacksonvilleumc.org, and learn more about our church. And if you have more questions, feel free to contact the church office, either by phone or email, and we'll answer those questions for you, whatever questions you may have. With that said, uh, let's now hear about our announcements, the things happening in the life of our church, how you can grow deeper as a disciple. So uh, I invite our worship director, Katie Howe, to uh, provide our announcements this morning. Good morning, everybody. This week, we are inviting everyone gearing up for back to school to have their backpacks blessed. This year's blessing of the backpack will be a little different. This time, we will be doing a drive through blessing. Tents will be set up behind the Connection Center. We ask that everyone stay in their vehicle at all times, and everyone must wear a mask. Please note this event is also for those homeschooling this year. The blessing will take place today between 4 to 5 p.m. We hope you can make it. Next up, Youth Destination Unknown will meet tonight at 6 p.m. And lastly, the Tuesday night youth Bible study will study the commandment, do not misuse God's name. That'll be at 6 p.m. Now for something a little different, you may remember us asking for your beautiful photos last week. Thanks to Monica and Robert Meadows, we have a lovely video we would love to share with you this morning. Roll it! a minute Life's a circus and you're in it Too afraid to admit it You're spinning out of control So keep going like you got this Keep smiling just to hide it Keep moving not to notice It's slowly taking its toll the faster you can slow this down To the rhythm of right now The sooner you'll find your strength. Hurry up and wait. Rest your weary head for the moment. Hurry up and wait. Feel the burden lift off your shoulder. Hurry up and wait just a minute. I'm glad I got your attention. I think it's worth saying again, so I'm gonna say it again, say it again. The faster you can slow this down to the rhythm of right now, the sooner you'll find your strength. So hurry up and wait. Rest your weary head for the moment. Hurry up and wait. Feel the burning lift off your shoulders Hurry up and Wait We will hold it, not grow weary We will walk and not grow faint And wait, rest your weary head for the moment. Yeah, hurry up and wait. Feel the burden lift off your shoulders. So hurry up and let it not go weary. Walk and not grow faint. 
hurry up and run and not grow weary. Work and not grow faint. Hurry up and. Good morning and welcome to Children's Time at Jacksonville First United Methodist Church. Last week we started talking about grace, God's grace. And in the Methodist Church, we believe in three types of grace. Prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying. Last week we talked about prevenient grace, that grace that is there whether you know it's there or not. And I referenced this gift about it being a symbol of prevenient grace. You know what's there, you just don't know if you want to take it yet. So justifying grace is when you decide you want to take this gift. We don't open it yet, but this gift is now ours. Um, another word for justification is pardon. So it's that moment um, of justifying grace when we take this gift that God gives us and he pardons us. So God just gives us grace. We don't have to ask for it and we don't earn it. It's just given to us. Isn't that amazing that God would give us something like that? You know, at, I, at home, my boys, in order to earn money, have to do things around the house called, and they get money called allowance. And grace is something that God doesn't give, that we don't have to pay for. So let's pray. God, thank you for your grace, your self-sacrificing grace that you have given us that we don't have to ask for, that's always there no matter what we do. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Stephanie, for leading us in our children's moment this morning. As we continue in worship, let us go now to God in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we come before you recognizing our need for you and our need for your grace. We recognize our need for your presence in the world, and we ask that you would be present, that we would see you at work in the world. Help the scales fall from our eyes that we might see you in your work. Help us to recognize where you are and what you are doing. And give us the strength and the willingness to join you where you are. Oh Lord, we continue to lift up our community and our state and, the, and country and world. As many suffer from this pandemic, we ask Lord that you bring hope and healing that we pray for a cure so that our lives may return back to normal so that we can join in communion together. Oh Lord, we pray for those who are suffering, not simply because of the pandemic, but for other reasons, for economic insecurity, for those who are already dealing with difficulties in their lives, for those who are hurting and mourning. Let us not forget in the midst of what is happening to us, the others around us who are in need of your healing touch and love. And so we lift them now before you, asking that you would be at work, that your grace would fall like rain, that it would refresh and renew the lives of your people and all your creation. Oh Lord, we desire to be your people. We ask for the grace we need that we might indeed be your people. We give you thanks that your grace comes to us without asking, that your mercy is new every day, that your forgiveness is there already. We give you thanks for your prevenient grace, that grace that comes before we even know we need God. You are already at work. For this we give you thanks and praise. 
as we turn our attention toward your justifying grace. Help us to understand what it means to be pardoned, forgiven. Help us see the reality of our lives and our world and the need for such grace. And help us to accept that grace and to walk in newness of, a, of that of life. O oh Lord, we lift all of ourselves unto you, asking that you would use us and transform us, mold us and make us into the people you desire us to be. Heal us so that your world might be transformed. Begin with us and may it make a difference for others. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves and forgives us. Amen. As we continue in worship, we move toward the hearing of our scripture text today. Last week, we began by reading 1 John 4, 7 through 12. And I noted that each week in the next three weeks, we'll be reading the same passage. And so uh, we're looking at God's grace. And this passage really helps outline the understanding we have as United Methodists around God's grace. So I invite you in this moment to find uh, your Bibles, to turn to 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12, to join me in the reading of our scripture. And just as we do normally when we're here in worship, we stand for the reading of our word. And I would invite you, if you're able, to stand for the reading of uh, the scripture lesson. And we do that out of respect, just as uh, a bride who would enter in the sanctuary and all the congregation would stand for that bride out of respect and love for that bride. We do that for the word, too, out of respect for God's word uh, that is coming to us as a gift. So hear these words now from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is perfected in us. This is the Word of God, for we, the people of God, thanks be to God. You may take your seats. Would you join with me in a word of prayer as we ask the Holy Spirit to join us to hear God's word and interpret that word? Let us pray. O Holy Spirit, join us. Speak to us. Move in our hearts that we might understand what we have just heard. Help us to interpret your word. But even more so, not just to know it, but to believe it and follow it. Oh God, use me. Use my words. Use them to transform us and to make us new and to become more faithful disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in His name. Amen. When I was a kid, I remember the time in which we graduated from having the paper atlas in the back seat or, you know, behind the front seat in the little pouch to printing off directions from uh, MapQuest. You may remember, you know, it used to, we all had maps in the back of our, in our cars to help us get around. And then uh, suddenly we could go online and we could pick a destination and type it into that little bar. And then all of a sudden we would have all the directions we would need in order to get to that place. And I remember even as a kid, even whether it was with the Atlas or with those map quest directions, wherever we set off, my dad always took about a 15 minute block before a family trip to read the directions very carefully so he knew how to get to that destination. He would spend a pretty good amount of time studying those directions so he knew where he was going. 
Even when my parents were going to places that we knew how to go, they always had an idea of the, of the pathway of where they were headed. Sometimes we would take Sunday drives, and I hated Sunday drives. Uh, just because we were in a hot car for a couple of hours, and I was bored just looking out at uh, out houses and, and landscape and so forth. But I will tell you that my parents always had a sense of where they were going on those Sunday drives. They weren't aimless drives. They always had a sense of the destination. Destination gives purpose to the journey. It gives a goal to reach. And it's important to know the destination so that you know how to get there. Last week, we began a series entitled Amazing Grace, in which we are looking at in depth the grace and the way that, of God and the way that we understand it as United Methodists. Grace, that unearned, unconditional love that God has for us. It is the heart of the story of Jesus Christ. But the one thing we need to understand about uh, the story of Scripture and God's relationship to us and grace is the scope or the destination of that work. We need to understand the destination in which we are headed with God in order to better understand God's grace. It's easy to get off track if we don't know the destination or the goal. Last week, you may remember, we compared, or I compared the Christian life to that of a dance with God. That we were created to love God and enjoy God and, and be part of this beautiful dance in which we share our life with God fully and completely. However, as I noted last week, we divorced ourselves from our dance partner. We decided we were better alone, that our dance was better alone. We wanted to do it all by ourselves. And as a result, because we as humanity divorced ourselves from our dance partner, we became corrupted. We forgot the dance moves. We forgot how the good dance looked. In more theological terms, God created us in the image of God. We are created to enjoy that beauty and relationship with God, created in His character and likeness. And yet, because we walked away from God, that image in which we were created became distorted, or better yet, corrupted. Such corruption could be comparable to a corrupt computer file. How many of you all have ever had, uh, have, how many of you have ever been working on a computer and you're maybe doing a Word document or pro a Word processor or, or a other document, and you go to save that file and you hit save and all of a sudden it says, cannot save, corrupt file. Or uh, you go to open a file, something you've been working hard on and uh, you've been working diligently. And, and so you go to open the file and it says, unable to open file, corrupt file. Basically, the digital software can't read the file or somehow messed up writing the file and that data got scrambled. The computer can't read it anymore. It can't process the information and when it is corrupted, it cannot perform the task that it was originally created to perform. And in the same way, if we as humanity are corrupted, we cannot perform the task that we were originally created to perform. Now, the idea of, incorrupt, of corruption is very important, important to understand when it comes to the Methodist or Wesleyan understanding of grace. For to understand that we are corrupted gives us a sense of the scope of God's work in us and around us and through us. Basically stated, if we are corrupted, we are unable to perform the task that we were re originally created to do. And that what we need most of all is the healing of that corruption. That corruption needs to be eradicated or repaired. Thus, as we see it, the scope of God's saving work is nothing less than the healing of our own corrupt image in which we are created. That is the destination to which we are headed. And God's, this is what God's grace is seeking 
to accomplish. To restore us to our original purpose and intent. To put it in more theological terms, for us as United Methodists or Wesleyans, sin is a condition. It is not simply an action. Sin is a disease of the soul. A corruption that needs healing. It's more than just wronging someone or doing something bad, but it is a result of our own corruption inside that prevents us from acting righteously. It is a condition. And it is important to understand that we have this condition for us to know where God is taking us with God's grace. What we'll see is we'll certainly need forgiveness, but we will need healing even more. So the question becomes, how did we get to this point? How did sin enter into my soul? Why does Adam and Eve's sin in particular and their corruption become my sin and corruption? Why does Adam and Eve's condition become my condition? Throughout the centuries, there have been different theological ideas for how we become sinful people. For instance, there was a gentleman by the name of Tertullian. Tertullian lived in the second century, and he had this idea that was called transseducianism. Transseducianism basically stated that, uh, that our sinful nature was passed on from one generation to the, to the next generation as we procreate. The idea was that a fragment of Adam's soul was a part of everyone. That Adam's soul was passed on during, pre, uh, during procreation. And because Adam's soul was corrupt, thus the next generation and the next generation and the next generation was corrupt. It's not necessarily an uh, idea that I subscribe to personally. But that's one of the ideas. Another idea was that there was an argument called the federal head. The idea or the argument was made that Adam is our legal representative, the head of the family, if you will. And because uh, Adam's actions represent the entire family, therefore the entire family suffer the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. He represents the whole family. And as our representative, because he disobeyed, his guilt becomes our guilt. In a way, this also seems a bit unfair. And yet, for John Wesley and for we as Methodists, as I mentioned last week, the way in which sin or this condition of sin becomes part of us is that we have distanced ourselves from God. Our corrupt nature is the result of our own walking away. The significance of the fall is separation from God. And being separated from our source of life, we begin to die. Just imagine if we were to water a plant or to quit watering a plant. That water is the source of that plant's life. And if that water was cut off from that plant, it would begin to wilt even it could become diseased because it doesn't have all, it is not pulling all the right nutrients back up into the plant. It becomes prone to disease. And in the same way, when we separate ourselves from God, we lose our source of life. And thus, our nature becomes corrupted or diseased. We have all separated ourselves from God, walked away when God has beckoned and called. We have removed ourselves from the source of life. It doesn't matter which generation we are. We are prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. And we lack the presence of God. And without God in our lives, we wonder aimlessly, ir ignorantly. And we live out of a corrupt condition because we are not with the one who is righteous. And yet, as we discussed last week, though we are prone to wonder, walk away, walk away from our dance partner, dance on our own. God sees our helpless estate and God comes to us. Even before we recognize our need for God, God is already looking for us, searching for us, seeking us out. 
We call this prevenient grace. That grace that comes before we even know we need God. God is looking for us, searching for us, seeking us out, putting people in our path that we might hear God's voice, sense God's presence, experience the goodness of God, and thus begin to turn toward God. But one might argue, are we really culpable for our disobedience? Since we are acting out of our ignorance or our own corruption, are we really responsible for our sin? At first, we are tempted to write it off. It's just a condition of who we are. But, does the disease or corruption excuse the offense? When our daughter, when our daughter was four, I remember one time in particular, uh, we got into a little bit of a heated disagreement. It was bedtime for my daughter. And she didn't want to go to bed. And uh, we said, no, it's time to go to bed. And she said, no. And suddenly it ratcheted up and she began screaming at us. And she started saying, you all are disgusting. You all are the worst. Out of nowhere poured forth this vitriol and we knew that she was a four-year-old and she was just angry and upset about what was happening that she didn't want this to take place and yet some of the words that she said like you all are disgusting even though we chuckled a bit those words still stung they hurt i hate you they still tore apart the relationship and though we were big enough to handle it and kind of push it aside, still to this day I remember some of the hurt feeling that's there. And so there had to be some pardon, forgiveness, restoration of relationship. Even though she was not understanding fully what was taking place, it still stung, it still hurt it still tore a little bit apart of that relationship. Forgiveness was still needed. And in a similar fashion, with our corrupt nature, we still tear apart the relationship we have with God. We disobey. We act arrogantly. We destroy the peace that God has created. We hurt one another. We destroy God's good creation, sometimes out of ignorance, and yet it still ruptures that relationship that God had with us, that communion that God had with us. And even though we are corrupted, those actions still need pardon, forgiveness. That relationship still needs to be healed. And what we discover in the story of Scripture is much like prevenient grace. That God doesn't lay it upon us to seek forgiveness and to restore that relationship. God doesn't sit back in heaven and say, I'm just going to sit here and wait till they come ask for forgiveness. No, what we hear in the story of Scripture is that God says, I can't bear it any longer. I have to go to them. And I have to offer forgiveness to them. The one who was offended, the one whom we wronged, the one whom we walked away from. This God comes to us in Jesus Christ and forgives us. This is justifying grace. Justifying grace is the love of God that get, the love that God gives so that we are back in right relationship with God. In Jesus Christ, there is a relational change. Once we were enemies of God, now we are friends of God. All because of God's great love for us. Did you hear it in 1 John 4 again? In this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice for His sins, for our sins. The heart of the gospel is God forgives. When God doesn't have to, God forgives. That forgiveness is seen on the cross in Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, 
At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, walking away, ignoring God. God repaired the broken relationship, pardoned us of our sin, forgave us of our wrongs. Justifying grace is what God does for us, for you and for me. And it sets us on the right path toward restoration. It sets us on the path toward full restoration, toward our destination. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God forgives you? As the psalmist says in Psalm 139, such knowledge is just too wonderful for me. See what love the Father has for us that we might be called children of God. We hear in the scriptures. We corrupt, broken, weary, aimless people. Sons and daughters of God, not because of our goodness, but because God did this for us in Jesus Christ. Do you know God forgives? In the words of Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be? Hear these verses. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain. For me, who him to death pursued. In other words, to his own death, he pursued me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? God's justifying grace is offered to you and to me today. May we accept it, trust it, and experience God's freedom. May it be so. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Here at this table is where we experience God's prevenient grace and God's justifying grace as well as God's sanctifying grace. Here at this table, Jesus meets us and at this time, at home, I invite you to take those communion elements that you have. And reminder that we don't normally practice communion like this, but in times of ex uh, kind of extreme uh, circumstance, we have to adjust as we, as we need to. And so some of you are, have your elements at home and invite you to take those out at this moment. I would also remind you that right after this service, between 11 and 12 o'clock, I'll be in our church parking lot handing out communion elements from the service today, and you're invited to drive through, enter in off of Hickory Street, and then exit onto Main Street. But you can come by and have uh, me uh, provide those elements to you and also provide a blessing to you. So I invite you to come after the service. Let us now uh, join together as we prepare our hearts for this holy meal in our confession and pardon. Hear these words of invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Would you please join with me? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us take a moment and pray in silence to God, offering our own personal confession. Let us pray. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 
Glory Glory to to God. God. Amen. Amen. And now with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and blessed it. And then he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this as often in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave God thanks for it. And then he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died. Christ Christ is risen. risen. Christ Christ will come come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all those who are gathered in this place and upon those who are gathered uh, throughout our community. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit also on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, All honor and glory is yours, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will will be done, done, on on earth earth as it it is in heaven. heaven. Give Give us this day day our daily bread, bread, and forgive forgive us our our trespasses. trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those who have your elements now, you're welcome to partake of them and know that, you, uh, that God is present with you and that we are experiencing the grace of God. Let us experience this meal together. Would you join with me in a word of prayer, and then after our prayer, we will join together in our closing uh, hymn of praise, which is, uh, Love Lifted Me. Let us join together in a prayer. O Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we might go in the strength of that mystery to give ourselves for others. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand and join together in our closing hymn of praise, Love Lifted Me. to him I give 
prayer today is that you have experienced God's justifying grace, that you know that you are in right relationship with God because God has done it for us. And I pray you trust that grace, for that faith will free you and allow you to live in joyful obedience to Jesus Christ. So may we go and live in that grace. May it free us to love God and neighbor fully and completely. Go in grace and peace. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right.